Well, we have officially finished the lessons that we're going to study in Leviticus, and we're going to close this series for the next two weeks out of the book of Numbers. Now, Numbers is another book that people are like, uh, Numbers, who reads that? <laughs> But actually, Numbers is filled with truth and more of God's incredible power and his ability and his compassion and even his consequences for a rebellious nation. It's actually impossible to get through all of Numbers in two sessions, so I've selected two passages that we're going to focus on. But I'm not opposed to coming back to this book sometime in the future and looking at it in the excited way that we did with Leviticus as well. But today we look at a very popular passage that has been turned into a song and it's been turned into wall art. It hangs in people's uh, homes. Everybody loves this passage. They love the message. Many love singing about it, if you're familiar with the song. But most people don't know that it came out of the book of Numbers. You think, is anything good in Numbers? Yes, lots of things. And this is one of them. If you saw my email on Monday, it's the famous blessing. And it comes from Numbers chapter 6. And the, the Bible says this, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. Isn't that beautiful? This blessing was actually written by God. He dictated it to Moses himself, and they are fulfilled by God because the blessings are coming from God. Now, at this point in time, the Israelites have left the base of Mount Sinai. That's where they were in the book of Leviticus. And they've now moved into the wilderness, and they've set up their camps by tribes. And tribes meaning each tribe, the name of the sons of Jacob. So Benjamin and Naphtali and all these tribes were set up. They were actually only supposed to be there for about 40 days. But... If we remember, and if you came to the Bible in the year with Pastor Bill, we remember that in the book of Numbers, they sent spies out to go check the land, and they, besides Jacob and Caleb, everybody came back freaked out, and they didn't trust God, and they didn't move into it, and God was not happy with that. And so we know that the children of Israel wander in the desert for 40 years. So it's not just 40 days, but 40 years. Now, this is why we don't have time to discuss this today, but something fascinating, they didn't just go around like, ooh, where am I, where, where am I in the desert? That's not the kind of wandering that it was. It was actually very strategic and very intentional the way God had them moving. But they stayed there for 40 years, and many of the people who crossed over the Red Sea died because God said, you're not going to get to see the promised land. I'm going to give it to the generation after you. And after that time, the next set of people moved in. So this is where we are in the book of Numbers. They're beginning their time in the wilderness. The camps have been set up now. They've actually been cleansed according to the Lord's direction. And now this blessing follows. So a very appropriate order here. The Lord, the name of the Lord in this blessing, at the capital L-O-R-D, is the name Yahweh. And it's actually the name without any vowels. If you look at the Hebrew spelling of that, there are no vowels in that. This is considered the proper name of the one true God. The original name of God. God, what is your name? My name is Yahweh. It's, the, again, the spelling without vowels, and that means the self-existing one of selfless love. Each one of those Hebrew letters has a different meaning, and what you hear as you say them, it comes out to be the self-existing one of selfless love. 
It was a holy name. And the sages didn't want people using his name, this holy personal name, for common use. So they added vowels. It was like, well, if we add vowels and kind of change the sound just a little bit, it's okay to say over and over for common use. So they added the vowels and we get Jehovah. It's where we come up with the name of Jehovah. Now, I want to show you the blessing was spoken every single morning, uh, the end of every service in the morning, at the end of every service in the evening in the tabernacle or the temple. Something kind of interesting, if you can see here, here's proof of this blessing. This was one of the greatest archaeological finds. This was excavated in Jerusalem in 1979 and written on these tiny little mini um, and they're not scrolls, but little, they look like paper, is the blessing. It's this blessing. There was two of them that were found, and on both of them were found the blessing. They date back to the late 7th century, maybe early 6th century B.C., which was the first temple period. So this was given thousands of years before that and still remained up until that time. It's the oldest extra-biblical reference to Yahweh, the God of Israel, where they see his proper name written on here that was found. It's currently actually in the Museum of Israel. It's fascinating. Aaron would lift his hands and stretch out his arms over the people. And many, many say and believe that the priests would hold their hands out like this. Does this look familiar? To anybody? I, can, I can't keep those two together quite as well. But they would hold their hands up like this. You can see, I'm showing you this letter the priests formed with their hands and their finger. This is the Hebrew letter Shin, and it's the first letter in the name Shaddai. When we say, call God's name El Shaddai, meaning the Almighty One. El Shaddai was like a title of God. Remember his proper name? What's your name, God? My name is Yahweh. But you can call me Shaddai, okay? A title. This is a, a title of God, the Almighty One. Now, what's interesting about this? What do you know? What do you think when you see this? Star Trek, Spock, <laughs> Mr. Spock. Fun little fact, side note the actor who played Mr. Spock was Jewish and uh, believed that he incorporated the knowledge of this kind of peace blessing into the greeting, this Vulcan greeting. Isn't that interesting? Anyway, <laughs> exactly. The Lord bless you. So they would hold their hands over the people as, as God directed, and they would speak this blessing with the first letter pointing to the name of the Almighty One as they blessed the people. This blessing is written in poetic format. In the original Hebrew, if you look at it in the original Hebrew, the first line has three words, the second line has five words, and the third line has seven words. That's 15 words in total. And out of all of that in the entire blessing, there are 60 letters. Here's what's fascinating. In Hebrew, every letter is also assigned a numerical number. And the 15th letter with the numerical value of 60 is Samech. And the pictograph for this letter is a support or a prop. Samech means to lean on for support. Semech is used all over, actually, even the book of Leviticus. If you look at where Semech is used in the book of Leviticus, in the English, it's translated lay. So it's when the priest lays his hands on the goat or the bull or the scapegoat, transferring the sin of the person or the, of the people onto the animal he sacrificed. He is to Semech his hands on the animal, leaning on that animal for support or for rest or refresh or revival. So this blessing, God is wanting to bless his people who lean on him, who find support in him. It's a blessing of support. One where you can find rest. You can lean on God. 
and he will bless you. So we're going to look at the specific ways in which God blesses his faithful people. Let's break this apart. There are six blessings in the blessing. Number one, he literally says, bless you, and it's not because you sneezed. (laughs) He gives you good gifts. The word bless here is the Hebrew word barach, meaning to kneel or stoop down to bless. It's the idea or a word picture, if you will, of a king stooping down and giving one of his subjects a gift. It's a loving act. It's a favorable act. And this is how God is towards you and I. He stooped down. I mean, think about that. Stooped down so much that he left heaven and came down, literally came down in his unconditional love for you and gave you a gift. Not a present under a tree, not any kind of gift in an Easter basket, no birthday presents, not the wealth of the world, the gifts of himself. He gave the gifts of himself, gifts of love and compassion and protection and mercy and justice and tender loving care and gifts of abundance. What greater gifts? Paul writes in Ephesians that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. What are the spiritual blessings? The Bible tells us, Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is what? Given. Jesus himself, before he leaves, says to his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will what? Give you another helper to be with you forever. The blessings of God himself are the blessings of the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. For the Israelites in the wilderness, the blessing was God himself with them in the tabernacle, and he followed them in a cloud by day and fire by night. And then they had the promise of the coming Messiah. Today... We are blessed by Jesus who came to save, and we now have the Holy Spirit living in us. I mean, what greater blessings do we need? Incredible blessings. We have the Spirit of the Lord not somewhere up here on the stage in that or in the chair in a box somewhere. The Spirit of the Lord, you've been blessed, though may the Lord bless you with his spirit, with himself living in you, which is all compassion, all protection, all kindness, all peace living in us. May God bless you with the gifts of himself. What is God? God is all. He's not a pie graph of 10% this and 20% that and 30% this. He's a graph of all. All love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, self-control, mercy, justice, freedom, power, goodness, security. He's all sure and he's all confidence. May the Lord stoop down. May he kneel down and give you the gifts of himself through his son, Jesus Christ. Does the blessings get any better than that? By the way, God opens the blessing with that. And it just gets better. Not only he says bless you, he says may he keep you. This word keep means to protect or guard or watch over. The Lord is watching over you. He's protecting you. He's guarding you. You cannot be snatched from his hand. Just like an earthly father who watches over his child, maybe in the home or at the park or in a busy city or around a busy area, around strangers, amongst the evil in the world. A father, it could even be a mother or a grandparent or any guardian. That protector will not let anyone snatch that child from their hands. And our God is the same for us. As a child of God, you have been given to Jesus, and therefore you are protected. You are guarded from the enemy, snatching your soul. 
Just like a good shepherd protects his sheep from getting snatched by the wolves. Listen to what Jesus himself says in John chapter 10. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And he says it again. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. If you are a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, you will listen to his voice and you will follow him, meaning you are in agreement with him and his teachings and his commands and his words. And the blessing of that is eternal protection. You are kept by the Father, the one who is greater, the one who is stronger, the one who is victorious, and he will fight for you because you are in Jesus. I want you to picture the enemy coming after you, trying to drag you into his kingdom, into the pit of hell, trying to drag your already saved soul back into the pit of hell. But Jesus is actually holding you tight. He's got his arms completely wrapped around you, and you are in him because the Father gave you to him. And then the father comes up in a parental protection and he just covers you. He kind of puts this hedge of protection around you and says, not today, Satan. In fact, not any day. That's my kid. She's in my son. Do you see who's holding her? Never. Never her. You don't get her soul. It's already spoken for. She's mine. You are protected. You are kept by the Father. He is your keeper and he is your protector. And not only for eternity, but for daily circumstances as well. I want you to turn your Bible to 2 Samuel. So you've got to go forward a little bit uh, after Numbers. You're going to pass Deuteronomy and Joshua judges Ruth. And there you'll find the two Samuels, 1 Samuel and then 2 Samuel. Turn to 2 Samuel and find chapter 22. 2 Samuel chapter 22. And this is going to be a little lengthy as I read, but I just want you to envision this passage. This is about David. This is kind of David's song of praise because of God being his protector. David had been running from people who wanted to kill him, including King Saul, who he was friends with, <laughs> who he played the harp for. And he is frightened, he's exhausted, he's discouraged, and he's overwhelmed. Life's circumstances, the tribulations in life are still being impacted by him. And yet I want you to listen to how he calls out to God, his keeper and his protector, and then hear the kind of protector God is. 2 Samuel 22, starting in verse 2. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. From violent men you save me. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I am saved from my enemies. The waves of death swirled about me, the torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D. 
I called out to my God. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came to his ears. The earth trembled and quaked. The foundations of the heavens shook. They trembled because he was angry. Smoke rose from his nostrils. Consuming fire came from his mouth. Burning coals blazed out of it. Why was he angry? Because people were pursuing his child. This is like a papa bear. Verse 10, he parted the heavens and came down. Dark clouds were under his feet. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his canopy around him, the dark rain clouds of the sky. Out of the brightness of his presence, bolts of lightning blazed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven. His voice of the Most High surrounded. He shot arrows and scattered the enemies. Bolts of lightning and routed them. The valleys of the sea were exposed. The foundations of the earth laid bare. At the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of breath from his nostrils, he reached down from on high and he took hold of me. He drew me out of the deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was was my what? Support. He brought me out of the spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not done evil by turning from God. All his laws are before me. I have not turned away from his decrees. I have been blameless before him and have kept myself from sin. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. To the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To the blameless, you show yourself blameless. To the pure, you show yourself pure. But to the crooked, you show yourself shrewd. You save the humble, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them low. You are my lamp, O God. The Lord turns my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance and against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? Jump down to 36. You give me your shield of victory. Listen to this. You stoop down. To make me great. You brought in the path beneath me so my ankles do not turn. This is found in Psalm 18 as well. This, ladies, is your keeper and your protector. Not only for your soul and eternity, but for today's circumstances as well. And we know the story of David. He wasn't perfect. But he, that's for sure, someone said. <laughs> But he was a man after God's own heart. He did come to a place of repentance as well. And he did do many things right in the eyes of the Lord. God isn't looking for perfection. He looks at your heart. Do you love him above all else? Are you sorry? Do you mourn for your own sin above all the sin that we do when we make and we decide? Are you humble? Are you willing to come to a place of humility? God cares about our heart. He will do this for David. He will protect David in this manner. He will protect you. You too are his child, completely wrapped and covered and protected in his son, Jesus Christ. The same God. He is faithful and he shows himself faithful to the faithful. It's amazing and it keeps getting better. He shines his face on you. The blessing says, may his face shine upon you. He wants to have a close relationship with you. Isn't that a beautiful image? Things that shine are beautiful. They're beautiful. Think of the sun on a cool summer month. I know we don't have too many here, but if you can just envision it, when we walk out on a cooler month, 
and the sun is shining. I don't know about you, but one of my favorite things to do if I'm a little chilled is to stand in the sun and turn my face actually towards it and feel the warmth of the sun on my face. God desires a close relationship with you and I. His face shining on us is representative of his presence with us. When he shines his face on us, it's as if God is looking at us with eyes of love and goodness. He's smiling on us. In fact, some translations say, may he smile on you with the eyes of love and goodness, and light that is actually directed right at you and on you. All the love in his eyes looking at you. All the goodness in his eyes on you. And in order to have a relationship, we actually then need to be looking at God as well. Putting our face to the sun and feeling that warmth, that love, that goodness. All those things are warm. After all, what kind of a relationship is it if one person is looking at the back of someone's head and even walking away from them? That's not very relationship-like. God wants to be in close relationship for us. He's willing to shine his face on us, to look intently at us. Will we look at him? You know, in heaven, everyone is doing nothing but looking at God. And praising God. In fact, there isn't another option. There is no other choice. It's just what you do. It's going to be the only desirable thing to do. And in the complete opposition in hell, everyone's doing nothing but turning their back on God and cursing God. It's a complete opposition. And here we are on earth, somewhat in the middle, in the in-between, where at this point in our life, we have a choice to either face God or turn our back away from God. God says in Deuteronomy 30, 19, I have set before you life and death. Now choose life. Turn your face towards God as well because he's shining his face on you. He's not going to shine his face on the ones who turn their face away from him, and choose death. When God shines his face on us, he delights in us looking back at him, loving him too, desiring him too. He offers us intimacy with him through his son, Jesus, who is the light of the world and who brought the face of God to the world. The eyes of unconditional love and forgiving love and patient love and redeeming love. And when we are in close relationship with God and his face is shining on us, then we should shine and radiate the blessings and holiness of God out for others to see as well. If you remember Moses, when he went to go speak with God, his face, the Bible says, was a radiant face or a shining face. When he was in the presence of God, that shine came like on his face and he would go out and it was seen. You could see it. How many times have you all been out in the sun before, whether it's recent or in your younger years, and your face has been burned? <laughs> burned by the sun. Me. And people look at you and they're like, wow, did you get sun? They see it. They see that your face is different. It looks different. God's shine should give us a God burn. Use sunscreen, everybody. Don't worry about the, that sun. Get a God burn in you. People should notice something different about our face. Our eyes should be filled with the shine of God's love. Our smile should be filled with the shine of God's goodness. And we should reflect God's shine back out into the world. And blessing says, be gracious to you. Again, this word gracious is that of a king stooping down in his kindness and his care towards someone who is inferior to him. This kindness shown to an inferior is undeserved. It's the idea that the subject to the king 
has wronged the king and the king has every right to bring about punishment with all the power that he has to do that. But in his gracious, undeserved way, the king stoops down in compassion and mercy and tenderness and he offers kindness and care. Oh, the graciousness of God who stooped down to his subjects to become human, Jesus Christ, and to show us his kindness and his care for us. I mean, that's incredible kindness and so much care to the point of dying in our place. Ephesians says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, not by your work so that no man can boast. May the Lord be gracious to you. God is a gracious God. He lifts his face towards you. He delights in you in a way that a parent delights in their children. Now, I've got this picture up here. Don't worry, that's not Michaela's child. <laughs> we were in Bolivia, and she picked up. But this is the image I want you to hold on to when you read this part of the blessing. It's the idea of the way that a, a parent picks up their child and lifts their face and gives 100% of their attention right on the face of that child. It's as if God himself picks you up and is holding you up like this, lifting his head and looking directly at you. It means this idea of lifting your face, your Bible might say countenance, to give full attention. Turn all of your attention to their needs and their desires because you delight in them. We read about that even in 2 Samuel. David said, you did this for me because you delight in me. Do you know that the Lord delights in you? Has that truth sunk into your heart? Do you believe that? David also wrote in Psalm 17, he asked the Lord to keep me as the apple of your eye. Whoever is the apple of your eye, that phrase, is someone that you love and you cherish and you value. The original text for apple of your eye in the Hebrew is keep me as the little man of his eye. Or in our case, the little woman of his eye. So when you look deep into someone's eye or really close into someone's eye, you can actually see a tiny, tiny reflection of yourself in their eye. So when God has his face turned toward us and looking directly at us and we are looking back at him, we see ourselves in him. We are the apple of his eye, the little woman of his eye, and he delights in us. It's a blessing to have God's face turned toward you. It is his favor on you. In some versions, it'll say, may his favor be upon you. The Bible actually records instances where God turns his face away as a consequence for those who rebel against him, who turn away from him, who idolize other gods or elevate themselves above him. So it is indeed a special blessing to have the Lord's face turned toward you. The last thing he says here is to give you peace, may he give you peace, resulting in an abundant life. The word peace here is the word shalom. And it has a way more depth of meaning than just a greeting of hello and peace to you. It's a peace that actually means total well-being, completeness, and wholeness. It speaks to the welfare of the individual, the satisfied condition. In a sense, everything you need for this life to get through this life, God wants to give to you. And how are you going to get through this life? What is it that he's going to give you in order to get through this life? His peace. And he did that in his son, Jesus. John 10.10, 10, Jesus himself says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. And a few chapter late, chapters later in John 16, he told his disciples that they would have peace 
in him because he tells them that this world is actually the opposite of peace. It's going to offer you tribulation. It's going to offer you challenges and trials and hardships and times. So what's the best gift I can give to you? God says in the blessing and Jesus says as he's here, I'm going to give you my peace because in me is total well-being. In me is completeness. In me is wholeness. In me is satisfaction. And in me is everything you're going to need to get through the trials, to get through the tribulations. Because Jesus says, take heart. I've overcome the world. So my gift to you, my blessing to you is my shalom, my peace. And we'll have an abundant life. This word abundant means greater than, more than, excellent, above all else. Quite frankly, let's be honest here. It is impossible to have an abundant life in this world full of tribulations without the blessing of God's shalom, God's peace. God wants you living abundantly in and through his son, Jesus. If you are trying to live abundantly on your own, to pull up your bootstraps or put on your big girl panties, stop it. Live abundantly in Jesus. Through his peace. He says, my peace I give to you. If you want to live excellently and greater than and more than, you got to have the peace of Christ in this turbulent World filled with tribulation. He blessed the Israelites with his, with his peace through being with them in the tabernacle and the temple. Today, he blesses us with his peace through his son, Jesus Christ, living in us. God gives peace, the peace which finds our souls, finds rest, peace that surpasses all understanding, peace that allows us to be whole and complete, and peace that allows us to live an abundant life. And all of these things are personal. These blessings are for you. Do you see in your handout there how I bolded and italicized the word you? That was unintentional. So you would recognize exactly to whom these blessings belong. The word you can have two different meanings. It can be like right now I could, I'm talking to you, meaning this whole collective group. Or it could be you, you singular, individual. And in the blessing, when it says, may he bless you, give you peace, may his face shine upon you, it's used in the singular. Now, it was delivered to the community, but it was meant for each individual person to hear it and receive it in a very personal way. As a child of God who walks faithfully in obedience to the word with a heart surrendered to him, your heavenly father desires to bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you and turn his face toward you and give you peace. Individually, you put your name in there. Take out the you and put your name in there. And make it personal because that's what God is saying. And if that wasn't enough, the last verse is equally or perhaps, in my opinion, even more of a blessing, perhaps an honor. The greatest honor bearing the name and reputation of God. Verse 27, why am I blessing them? So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. By the priests saying this blessing over the people, they put the name of God on them. As a believer in Jesus Christ, his name is written on our hearts. It's written on your heart. We bear his name and his reputation. When I got married to Jeff, I went from Brinkman to Schuler. I now bear the Schuler name, and I, I represent the name of Schuler. We are the bride of Christ, so we take the name of Christ, and we bear his name, and it's an honor. 
it's a privilege that we shouldn't take lightly because there's also great responsibility with it. I'm part of a network called the No Excuses University Network, and the founders are wonderful Christian people as well. And when we have conventions and conferences around the country, every once in a while we have a convention held in Las Vegas. And before, on the first day after the convention is done, the founders always just say to the people who are there, we ask you to make the family proud. Okay, go out because there's going to be a lot of temptations out there. So especially they say, if you're going to wear a shirt that has our logo on it, that has any you on it, just remember you're part of this family and we ask you to make the family proud because you are representing our name. And we know the temptations in Vegas. Okay, this is the same with the family of God. We must preserve the reputation of God's name. We don't wear God's name on a shirt and take it on and off every night or on a necklace or on earrings. We wear it on our hearts so it's with us all the time. His name is with us all the time and we have a responsibility to reflect well the name of the Lord. And then God says in all this, I will. Do you see those two words? I will will bless him. Those two words are so important, ladies, because this is not a fickle thought or a suggestion. It will happen. God will bless you. There is no enemy that can stand against it and there's no power that can interfere with it. He is not a God of to pull bait and switch. With your face turned toward him and with a heart that longs after him and a desire to live in covenant with him, he will bless you. God cannot lie. So if he says he will do it, he will do it. So how do we apply all of this, applying numbers to my life? We can expect that God desires to bless us. This blessing was spoken, like I said, every morning and evening after the services by the priest, and God speaks it over you today in Jesus. Do you know and realize that God desires to bless you? And do you expect that? You know, if you expect your husband or any other loved one that you're close with to love you, to bless you, to protect you, to be gracious to you, how much more your heavenly Father who has more love, more protection, more blessing, and more grace. It's okay to live expectantly of the Lord. He wants to bless his children. Remember, he wrote this blessing. He wrote it. He said, tell them. This is what's going to happen. Did you know that the very last thing Jesus did before he ascended back to his father after his death and resurrection was he gave this blessing? Luke 24, 50. When he, that's Jesus, had led them, his disciples, out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them with this blessing. He blessed his disciples. What is a follower of Christ? A disciple. So if you have claimed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you consider yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ, Jesus speaks this blessing over you as well. And as we've learned in the previous weeks, those who believe are considered a part of the royal priesthood. You are a royal priesthood, a chosen nation. You too, we have a high priest, but we too are in the royal priesthood. And we can speak these blessings over our loved ones as well. We can.